Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are Wanderlust. My name is Ida, and this is ND. Woo. And this is the final installment of the Wanderlust School of Selling Out. I want to send a huge thank you to Kickstarter. It has been an absolute pleasure having this here. Uh, yeah, and absolutely everybody we've worked with has been uh, really wonderful and on their game. So uh, it's, been, it's been great. Um, thank you all for being here. The topic for tonight is deals. Um, we're going to chat for a bit, and then we'll have some questions afterwards. So come up with hard questions. And yeah, tonight we have David Lavin, Andrea Calvaruso, Ari Kushner, Julia Pimsler, and moderating will be Sunny Bates. Thank you guys so much. Sweet. Excellent. Well, that was a quick intro. I think that um, um, I'd love to ask a couple of questions, starting with um, uh, how many of you here are, would describe yourselves as being creative first and foremost? Show of hands. OK. How many of you would describe yourself as being uh, comfortable in the, in the world of business? OK. Um, because we, had, we have two people here who sort of go back and forth in that, which is to say, both Julia and Ari, when I was asking, if you want to talk a little bit about that sort of interplay about um, either being a creative person and now being in business, or running a business creatively, or running a creative business. Talk about that a little bit, would you? We're gunning for the uh, least experienced on Perfect. the panel spot. <laughs> so we start, well, let's start there. Let's start with a really easy one. Well, no, I think there's, well, first off, we should say that Wanderlust is awesome. I don't know. The best, if, absolutely. I don't know if uh, everyone knows. That we all dream of taking. I don't know if everyone knows. Transgressive, what these so guys fun. do, they're incredible. Um, uh, so as far as running a creative business, it is that kind of thing where you know I went to film, I went to business school first, and I quit business school because I hated it. I fucking hated it, mm -hmm. and I could, and I was like, I'm gonna be creative now. I'm gonna do either a film thing or a music thing. I'm gonna find my my creative passion. And I went to film school, and I found editing as a as a passion. And um, for the longest time, I was just like, I think I'm gonna be a really good editor, and I could feel. I could sort of feel myself rising through that. And at some point, the ambition changed. And the ambition went from like uh, good editing to, well, what's it like to um, have a creative company, creative production company? And so it started from there. So I do find myself straddling this line of like, on one hand, some of my favorite moments are when I get to interject creatively or work with one of our directors or in a creative situation. And the other hand, one of my favorite things is making a deal. And I think that's maybe why I'm here. Because <laughs> it is a very uh, momentous thing and growing the business and really uh, running it and really uh, nurturing that. So it is this um, weird thing. Where I don't know if, if it's like oh, that yeah, for you, but you sort of switch yeah. from one to the other, right? Absolutely. No, I started out running a documentary film production company. I went to film school and never went to business school, thought about it, but then wanted to start this film company very much to make social issue documentaries. And the business part was just the means to the end. That was like the part I didn't really like to deal with, but we wanted to make these films, so I had to figure it out. And then at the end of the day, I wound up loving the business part and ultimately left the documentary film production company and started a business with a creative idea at the center of it. We're teaching young children how to learn foreign languages through a multimedia series. So it's deeply creative, but it is a business, a for-profit business. And uh, I kind of became, I was a creative person with a business idea, and now over the course of about six years, I've become a business person running a business with a creative idea at the center of it. And that's been like a full cycle of you know professional development and training and learning about deal making and all some of the things I'm sure we'll talk about today. Right. Speaking of deals, Andrea, um, can you talk just a little bit about the art of the deal? Um, you're a terrific lawyer, and I think one of the issues that people would talk about is when should somebody here who's got a, an idea or thinking about protecting something or a business they want to start or artwork that they want to protect or something that's intellectual property, when should they call a lawyer? Okay, so we talked about this a little bit kind of offline. And my honest answer is, if money is not an object, and I understand it usually is, call a lawyer first. Call a lawyer before you give up, give anybody your ideas, keep it close to your chest, don't tell your best friend, because believe me, I'm also a litigator, and it's often those who are your best bud, your partners, that, that 
comes back to bite you. But if money is an object, and it usually is, you just have to sort of be smart to look for the signs, right? So it's really dependent on what you're selling. Um, if you have an idea, big idea, those are the hardest things to protect. So those things you should be really careful about guarding closely because first of all, you, you wanna talk to a lawyer about is this something I can protect in some way? There are sort of different ways to go about it. But also, even if you're gonna enter into a, a deal and your idea is yours and it might be hard to protect under intellectual property law, you might still be able to not reveal the idea, you know, still do the service and not re reveal the big idea, but you can contract in a way with the person that you're doing the deal with so that if it's revealed during the course of your business with them that they are not allowed to use it or disclose it to anyone else. So it's important before you disclose how your idea works, um, unless it's something that's kind of obvious and, and in that case you're, you're kind of at their mercy, it's important to look for, the, look for the opportunity to not disclose your idea and then see a lawyer, try to paper it so that at least you're protected as between them going out and running with your idea after they pay you whatever probably nominal sum they want to pay you to sign you up. The best deal isn't necessarily about money. I mean, money's always a part of it, but I think there's a lot more nuance. Do you want to talk about that a little right. bit? Right, so exactly. So it, I obviously have a certain perspective because I'm an intellectual property lawyer, so I am usually doing deals that involve IP, um, and I'm trained to look at the deal or think about the deal in a way to anticipate problems down the road. So. One of the things is an example I just gave, which is you wanna, you wanna try to, to the extent you can, and I understand you have different leverage, and then that's gonna come down to a whole different discussion, but you should at least start with, what is it, what services is it, is it that I'm providing? Do I have protection for it? Do I wanna keep them from using it? Um, what are they trying to give me in return? And you know, what kind of things could go wrong down the line where I wish I would have protected myself? So money is obviously very important, but often the smartest people are the people who realize um, that what, what they have that's of value to the person. Why does this person want to do a deal with me? And can I walk away from this deal without having give, given it away, essentially? Mm -hmm. So speaking of leverage, <laughs> David. Creative people are really good at giving their shit away. I they know, are. absolutely, I right? right? And I will say the wonderless people who I worked before are very smart and savvy. So to the extent that you guys know them and, and can learn from them, it's, it's, it's great. You know, it's freer than a lawyer. Not that you should be lining up at their door, <laughs> but um, you really have to know your value. And I know that's really, really hard when you're an artist because I deal with lots of you know startup. I, I deal with big companies, but I also deal with a lot of startup jewelry companies and fashion companies and all sorts of people, and those are frankly my favorite clients because they're fun and I'm actually helping them and they're so grateful because they're learning stuff and I'm learning stuff about their business. But so many of them are so anxious to sort of get the right deal or get the money or the recognition that they're not, you know, they're not as focused on what's gonna happen after this deal. Am I still gonna have my great ideas? It's gonna be mine, my, my art, my music, Control. my whatever yeah. it is. Andrew, you're reminding me of all the hours and hours I spent on the phone with my lawyer when I was starting my company, but he was amazing. And I found that if I had the courage to say which things I didn't understand, which I sometimes felt really kind of silly about, like, oh, I should probably get how this all works. But once I got over that, he became such a great partner to me in navigating, like I had a first big angel investor who wanted a big chunk of my company yeah. for what, in retrospect, was kind of a small amount of money. At the time, it sounded like a lot of money, $80,000. Wow, that's huge. Nobody else was lining up to give me $80,000. And you know what? She got a good deal. And you know, in retrospect, would I have done anything differently? Probably not, because for me, so many deals are about, what do you want more? Exactly. It's going do you want to spend eyes. another year and a half raising money, or do you want to give up this chunk of your company? And I wanted to get that fucker off the ground, exactly. and I did. Exactly. <laughs> and, you're not, and, you're, and you're in the majority, but I think the smart, the smart thing is that even if you would go back and do it the same way, it's really knowing what questions should I be asking, understanding, you know, it's your decision what, what you give and what you get, but understanding the landscape is important and really knowing what, what what the benefit of your bargain is. So it's really important. But if really I may important. say also not relying too much on your lawyer because I've been in a lot of deals where the lawyer thought I knew more than I knew. And especially when I was raising venture capital, you know, there was so much terminology around mm -hmm. that world. And when he was throwing around you know, liquidation preferences and discounts and all this stuff, I didn't know what it was. If I didn't ask, 
I you, wouldn't, you would never know. And well, so and I could have gotten really short end of the stick. The idea of a, of a lawyer being a real thinking partner, especially in those early stages, that find somebody you, could, you have great rapport with and right. exactly. they can be a thinking partner because they'll be a real asset for you. Right. Um, quickly, on um, sort of moving uh, slightly to a different area, when you, when you mentioned, Andrea, you mentioned leverage. And I was just thinking, David, you are in the business of working with talent, as in speaking talent, and selling that talent to organizations that are paying for it. So you've got experience in terms of how to maximize one's value and also a little bit about what are people as in companies paying for right now? What are they interested in right now in terms of talent, in terms of ideas, in terms of intellectual property, if you will? Well, there's about six questions there, so there you go. Uh, I'll so start with... Answer whichever one you like, and then, whatever order you want. And, you want and the seventh question you asked me hot. backstage was like, what's hot? And I think what's hot okay, in my what's world hot? is actually money. Money is very hot, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, hot. so the lawyers can talk about all the other stuff, and I understand I'm talking about this. And, um, and uh, so you also have to understand, I'm Canadian, I'm a left-wing Canadian. Uh, my inner socialist means that we should be redistributing wealth, and the people in this room should have more of it, and the people outside the room should have less of it. Um, and uh, so what I talk about is uh, how, do, how do you ask for money? I mean, I, because I think one of the things that, you know, in any kind of deal, uh, it's critical to know that um, you have to ask a lot of questions because you might be saying, oh, what am I worth? Am I worth $80,000? Am I worth this? And it doesn't matter what you think you're worth at this stage of the discussions. You have to find out what they think you're worth because often they think you're worth more than you think you're worth. I mean, I, I learned this through a lawyer. I'll tell you that I was negotiating a deal with you, another law firm, <laughs> hi, hired me to consult, and they were, they were doing a deal on the behalf of a corporate client with the biggest entertainment lawyer in Canada. So I talked to them, I consulted with them, I discussed the, the, this endorsement deal, and I said, and we figured out that it was worth $100,000 to them to pay this person. And so this lawyer walked in the room, and he's just a big, powerful lawyer, you know, banged the table and said, I'm not taking less than $50,000 for this deal. I don't care what you say, it's take it or leave it or we'll walk. And they were ready to pay 100. So they, uh, the, they, this guy didn't ask a single question. And I love that you said you gotta ask the right questions. Uh, because um, that's what you have to do. If somebody calls you up and wants to give you money or is interested in your idea, you have to ask them why. And what I find fascinating, and I do this every day, if somebody says, what's this person's fee? And I ignore them. Yeah. I just ignore them. I ignore what they want to know. The number, the number first loses. Is that, that's always been my experience. Well, I, I don't think it's that, but it ends the conversation. Mm -hmm. if you, you know, how much is X? X is $10,000. Okay, the conversation's over. So what I would say, why do you want this person? Because mm -hmm. often they want this person for all the wrong reasons. You know, but so you have to, and, and the amazing thing is they talk to you, and I think really it's because they spend all day on email, and nobody else has talked to them all day. <laughs> so you're the first, you, I actually care what you have to say. I'm gonna, your boss doesn't, I'll, <laughs> and so I'll talk to you. And they tell you all kinds of stuff. And, and the, more you t the more you ask, and, and the more you listen, by and large, the more money you make. And at some point you'll know it's worth X, and at that point you decide whether or not X is enough for you to accept. Yeah. So it's a funny thing. We're in a similar place when it comes because we have a I have a roster of directors essentially, and so what happens is sometimes agencies or brands will call with a with a proposition, and my least favorite is when they say, "Well, we don't know what the budget is, right? <laughs> like we don't like you tell us." And it's like, well, the reality of production and the reality of ideas and the reality of, um, in particular, video and film production is that it could. You know, it could be a $50,000 idea, it could be a million dollar idea. It's like you can almost execute the same kind of idea um, for a very different uh, chunk. So it always uh, bugs me from that, when it comes from that place of like, and, and I'm very careful not to uh, yeah. start the conversation from a place of, oh, it's X. And sometimes you have to fire the buyer because they actually realize you, they don't know what they're talking about. And, and, um, um, and one of my little truisms, I have like eight of them, I think, is that um, it's what you say no to defines you far more than what you say yes to. So you gotta say no to bad deals. I think everybody yeah. here has probably been nearly bankrupted by a bad deal that they made early on in their career. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's dangerous. It's better to walk away. If you, get, if, you, if you start to get nervous, if something doesn't feel right, trust it. Yeah, one of my mentors once said, um, it has to be, you have to take it, you have to take the job for something other than the money. It has to be one more reason other than the money, whether it's building a real or re a relationship or something. But it just, if it's usually for the money, it ends badly. Well, one of the things I'd love for you to go a little bit deeper into that, you have a reputation for your company, Missing Pieces, has a reputation for only doing the coolest job, only doing the coolest work. 
and clearly you can't frame things in that way. But how do you say no and how do you frame it so you get to work on projects that you love and have other people pay lots of money for you to do that? Well, it's a mirage. Uh, there, but that's okay. <laughs> so talk about the construction I mean, of a mirage. I mean, if fine. we're being honest, I mean, that's no, fine. I mean, part of it is being picky and being choosy, and it's what you're saying also, where it's like you're um, framing things in certain ways and you start putting out a certain thing so it attracts a certain thing. So we don't get some stupid like laundry detergent thing or something like that, whatever it might be. We tend to get these higher end um, or higher concept things because that's what the company's been putting out. But the reality of it is that you're, it's a funny thing. It's like you're putting out a certain vibe and you're hoping, you're sort of editing yourself and you're putting out a version of yourself that you think is the best version of the company creatively. And um, there's a lot of, you know, like everyone else here, I'm sure, there's a lot of skeletons in the closet mm -hmm. and a lot of shit that you're not proud of um, that you sort of, for various reasons, went the other way. Or hopefully, I didn't take it, because, like the mentor said, just for the money. But at the end of the day, you're trying to do it. Um, you're just trying to make, you're trying to put out something that comes back, right? It's a like-minded thing. And what I find is just, it's, it's as simple as that sometimes, where it's like being, choose, being picky, asking the right questions, um, choosing the right partners, and trying to make the best of that particular, uh, maximizing that and trying to make the most creative, interesting thing leads to great work, which then leads to being recognized for that work, which then leads to more great work. So I don't know if there's some kind of like silver bullet secret formula. I do know that what you see on the site um, uh, is a version of reality. And I think that's the case for all of us. I think we all edit our social media and our, we present ourselves in a certain way. And I think um, there's no shame in that. I mean, certainly like you have to pick and choose and angle it in a certain direction. So I don't know if that makes sense, actually. It makes great sense. Um, so David, you still haven't told us, besides money, what's hot, besides maximizing the money that you're paid for your work so and for your ideas or for the, your body of work, what else is hot? What do your clients hot, want what's to What's hot in my world is, um, you know, they, we, were, we run an intellectual talent agency, so we represent some really smart people. So things like big data is hot. Uh, you know, we represent people who talk about six-dimensional printing. Because uh, like 3D, 3D printing 3D is so 2012. Really? Uh, so what are, the, what are the next three dimensions? Uh, well, the, the Internet of Things, you know, is 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 going to be the uh, I think it's going to be a hot topic in, in that interview. But I mean, it, but in some ways, you know, what I'm looking at is different. I mean, I'm trying to I book like 1,500 speeches a year for people. Um, so um, you know, you probably don't, you know might not mind doing 1,500, but if you're doing five, if somebody wants your ideas then they're willing to pay a, lot, a premium because they want your ideas. Like say, they, let's say you want to do three speeches a year, I mean, you're not right for somebody like me, but they might pay you fifteen or $20,000 for those, right? Because, you know, like I, I consulted with um, one of the TED fellows on an event, and um, material scientists, like a really esoteric, you know, she's going to give a lecture on polymers, which I can spell, but I don't know what they are. There's and a market for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not being able to spell. And 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 uh, and you know she got you know fifteen thousand dollars for an hour of her time, which was fantastic, mm -hmm. I, I think. And and uh, so the, so the answer is that it, in some sense is I'm skirting the subject because I think if somebody calls you up and is interested in what you have to say, it could be worth a lot. And so you know, don't do anything for the exposure. This idea that information should be free, so should my mortgage. Well, it's so, out of context, right? What's the rest of that? Does yeah. anyone remember the rest of that line? The information like when you, should be free and? Does anyone know this? No. It's actually yeah. like that line is taken out of context. It's Stuart yes. Brand, right? Yeah. Or Negroponte, who said that? But anyway, they, if you look up the quote and you read the rest of it, it provides a lot more context than just okay. as, a, as a standalone slogan. Information should be free unless you want to pay your mortgage. Yeah. <laughs> it's not quite that, part. but it's a version. <laughs> but no, it's a, OK, <laughs> well, then I love it. Then. But, but I, David, know. I wonder about that because um, I'm involved in the entrepreneurs' okay. organization, and like we won't book a speaker unless we can see their reel on YouTube and see a bunch of their stuff. And yeah. so, what would you say people should do? It's kind of a chicken. Well, I mean, there's a difference right? between watching, you know, a three-minute promo. That's like an advertisement. Although, you know, I, I'm I'm old, and I, I remember the good old days before the internet, where people would actually just do what I told them. You should, you, know, <laughs> okay. you, you should book this good person. Luck. They're good, <laughs> honest. And now, you know, they get some crappy motivational speaker who spends two hundred thousand dollars doing a promo reel, and um, and the good ideas actually sometimes get buried by those, you know, because they've got a great promo reel, but they actually don't have any content. 
Um, so, so, your so advertisement's are... okay. I don't allow my speeches to be, I'm very adamant about it. I don't allow uh, my clients to be taped and, and for, their, for their stuff to be online. But what there are exceptions. Because I know a lot of your clients speak at TED and TED doesn't pay. So where do you make the exceptions? You make the exceptions. That's, online. that's all online. That's yeah. where they make the reputation. So you're, when you're saying some people make their don't reputation. ever do things for free, but obviously there's some places where you build up your, your reputation. But some of my clients get invited to TED and don't go because they don't get paid. And, and, um, fine. And, which is fine. And, but some of them go because it is great exposure and it does make people stars. But TED is a platform that makes people stars. It's like having you know, a New York Times best-selling book for eight, eight weeks, right? Also make you a star. Uh, it's a platform. But a lot of the, everybody, I get, we get... 10 calls a week from people saying, we're doing something just like TED, so it should be free. Right. <laughs> well, actually, there is nothing else just like TED. There's TED, and then there's, you know, not TED. <laughs> and so, uh, and, um, you know, so it can, it, you know, if you want to speak for free, you could do it every day for the rest, for the rest of your life. Right. But isn't so there a certain amount of building up social capital and building up a, you know, well, there is, there is. I, mean, I look at it. They call. I said, "Hey, I got, if I say to them, hey, I got somebody who'd be happy to speak for free.'" I said, "Oh no, we don't want that person. We want this person." Well, then, okay, you know what they? You want that person, and they're worth something to you. So now we're just discussing what they're worth, and um, and and you know. Uh, you, but you, you, you do things for love and for money. I mean, we're all doing this for love. We're not being paid that much, really. Um, to be sitting here, right? So I think there's other things that people will do, and there's that's part of the gift economy. It's yeah, yeah, big, there is that. There is that. Generous spirits. Well, I tell my clients along, they should right? they should they should do a charity. They, they should support a charity. They should have things that they do is for free. But you know, you don't do the Wisconsin Dairy Farmers for free, and uh, you do. There's a lot of events that um, that uh, you know. I mean, some of them I have issues with. You know, like like uh, you know, Google never says they never pay. They never pay. They never pay. They have paid me because I kept on saying no, and then they paid us. But Google is also like the world's richest corporation. They're not the Red Cross. I think Google should pay. Yeah. And, the, and, and, and the Red Cross you know, it, it has the option of not, not paying, mm -hmm. right? The, you know, um, so. I'm curious about your deal style. So when you're making a deal, do you go into like a different mode? Or are you just still you? Or what happens when you're making a deal? If I came to negotiate I, uh, with you. What you see is what you get. I don't, know. I don't know. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. I'm just curious because this, this came about for me yes. not that long ago when I was negotiating for venture capital. And I don't know how much you know about that, but not very many women raise venture capital. Only about 4% of venture capital gets invested in women-run companies every year. It's just extremely low. And when I was negotiating to raise this money, I went and saw one of my male entrepreneur friends who had raised venture capital. And he coached me to have this like really aggressive stance of like, if you won't meet me there, then I'm walking away and forget it. And he like laid it all out for me what I was going to say to them. And I was about to like pick up the phone and have this call. And I happened to have a call with my coach right before that. And my coach was like, well, that doesn't really sound like you. And you know, what if we kind of rephrase that? And I wound up saying to them, like, look, I want this to be a win-win. I want us to feel really good about it. It was like much more me. And you know, coincidentally yeah. or not, you should never, that worked out. The, yeah. the you should deal never give great. somebody an ultimatum. I mean, like, you should never, I, I, I never believe in going hard. I mean, with those extreme cases where people say, well, you know, you, your, your client should come to our conference for free. And so, well, you're getting paid for your ideas. My client should get paid for theirs. Most groups, it's actually very collegial. They actually, they, they, they're, um, um, sometimes I think that, you know, lawyers are naturally adversarial. We actually want something good to come. And we're also paid by the deal, not by the, the hour. So we actually want a deal to happen. And we want a deal that, that's, and, and, and we want to do business with this person next year. So we actually do try to do the proverbial win-win. But we have to ultimately get our clients what they're, they're worth. But I think when you're creative and you spend a lot of your time in this sort of very collaborative peace and love space, right? And then all of a sudden it's like time to negotiate the deal. And do you sort of take on another persona? I had a lot of people coaching me to do that, to be honest, early in my career. Now I've kind of moved away yeah. from that. But I'd be curious. I, I don't think you should ever negotiate folks. your own deal. Sorry. So oh, I was going to say back to the go. lawyers when you were saying serial nasty lawyers. when you and David you threw out we the don't that, always kill deals that throwaway no. line, but the lawyers are naturally adversarial. What do you feel about that, Andrea? Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't right know. Next to I feel like that's a self-reflection question. Mm. Um, <laughs> no, no. Look. Well, my divorce lawyer work. Well, that's a whole other issue. That's a whole other issue. I can't get you on a DWI, and I'm not a criminal lawyer. So, no, I think. I think that adversarial is sort of a nasty pejorative word. I think lawyers are advocates if they're a good lawyer. And, and so sometimes 
I am aggressive and adversarial when it serves my client's purpose, and sometimes I'm not because oftentimes, you know, you're in a deposition or you're in another situation, you often can get more out of somebody by being nice and, and trying to let them warm up to you, and you know, and then you'll just have a, a good conversation. So I think it really depends on the, I mean, I, and obviously every lawyer is different, no matter what people think, but um, uh, you know, a good lawyer, I think, is, is able to adapt and is able to know their client. Some clients want you to be, you know, I want a bulldog, I hate that kind of a remark. You know, it's like, yeah. well, that's kind of stupid. You know, just, just, you don't want to fight just for the sake of fighting, but lawyers should be an advocate and, and you should be able to use your, whatever role that you need to, to use to, to get the, you know, to get the deal done and it reflects your client. And, but I do agree that it's difficult for someone who is also the business person to then have to go negotiate and be their own advocate with somebody who's going to be then a business partner, like in the sake of raising funds or, you know, you're going to do a deal with somebody. But it's only it's recently that we could really afford a lawyer, you right. know, so and I, I think for that. a lot of people, they are negotiating their own deals. I mean, if you have a lawyer, then there's a wonderful sort of good cop, bad cop thing mm -hmm. you can right. do, but too. But you know what you can do, even if you don't have a lawyer, but hopefully you're getting legal advice or something, is you just blame it on the lawyer. That's what I tell my clients all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because everyone hates lawyers, Perfect. and it's easy to say, mm -hmm. yeah. well, you know, I would work with you on this, but, you know, my lawyer, she tells me I can't do it, and I, you know, I always listen to her because she's really smart. And charming and not and beautiful. So good. And I wish I knew that. I wish I knew that like nine years ago. Yeah. But seriously, it, it sounds really stupid and obvious, but it really works. I mean, if you just blame it on the lawyer, everybody wants to blame it on the lawyer, and I'm fine with that. You oh, know? I, I, I tell them to blame it on their agent too. Right. Yeah. So, you know. so you know, look, I would do this, but my lawyer says if I do this, I'm basically giving up everything I've worked for. So I can't look. I can't do it. And and also, a good lawyer will tell you, it, it, just back to the terms of the deal. You know, I do a lot of clearance work. I look at ads for people. I do all kinds of things with business people who, you know, want to do something a certain way. And if I see particular legal issues with it, what I try to do, and what, again, I think a good lawyer tries to do, is, okay, look, here's the problems with this. But if you alter it this way, or what, what are we trying to do here? Here's a way where we could do it that will either lower the risk, if there's not a way to eliminate the risk, or is a way to you know, still make you happy, but make me happy because now your risk is like 20% instead of like 85%. So, and that, 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 I'm thinking of creative content, but you know, you could say that in any way. It could be a deal, any kind of a deal, um, or it could just be content. I mean, you guys probably deal with that all the time, you especially with, you know, clearing, clearing things. Oh, yeah. There's a brand um, person that I talked to that, you know, you come up with ideas for companies and, you know, you give it to the lawyers and, you know, the lawyers have the represent, you know, a reputation that they're gonna tell you no. A good lawyer won't just tell you no flat out, unless it's really something bad, and then they should tell you no flat out, and you should listen to them, but you should be able to work with it. Are there a series of things that you could that you could come to a lawyer with that would make their job easier, make it more cost effective, where you could say, you know, these are things we've thought about, this is where I'm willing to compromise, and so what things would make the, your engagement with a lawyer um, in terms of getting a deal done most effective, most cost effective? Right. I mean, I think just what you said. I mean, if, if you have to go and you have, first of all, you have to be honest with your lawyer. You have to understand that when they're giving you legal advice or hearing you, they're obligated to not tell anyone else. You know, they're not going to, don't be afraid to, to sort of be playing a role with your attorney. Like, you know, don't let somebody tell you, well, don't, don't tell the lawyer that because then they'll tell them that that's what you want. Go in, give all the information you have. What's the history? What have I done? You know, who else is out there that might do something like this? You know, to, to, when talking about intellectual property rights, you know, you might not want to say, "I got this idea out of," you know, it arose from this. I was inspired. By the way, you never took the idea from anyone. You were inspired. That's another free tip. Inspired by. Inspired by. by. <laughs> um, but you know, be honest with your lawyer because that's the only way that they can help you. And the more information you give, the quicker you can get exactly the point. And I would also say know why you're doing the deal. I was just thinking back on some of the deals that I did. And so early on in Little Pin's life, we were launching a kid's product. Mm -hmm. And we knew distribution was going to be really hard. We were doing an end run around Nickelodeon and Disney and all these big players in the space. And we had an opportunity to do a deal with PBS. Mm -hmm. Now, when we looked at this deal, we were like, this is going to cost us a lot of money. We don't know if we're going to make a lot of money. Like, if you added it up numbers-wise, it didn't really make sense. But I had one goal which was, I want that brand associated with my brand. We need right. credibility in the kids' space. So we did this deal with PBS. I convinced my board, and I had like went out way on a limb, walking them through what this would mean. And we slapped that PBS logo on every single DVD that we sold at retail, still on there. 
And it was a great deal. Now, did it make us a ton of money? No. You know, the board members didn't really understand why we wanted to do the deal. So that, that's one of the things that's been my guiding principles. Like, not all deals are about money, right? Sometimes you've got a different goal. Okay. And maybe helping the lawyer understand what your uber well, goal is. is there's a difference, too, between business issues and the legal issues, right? I yes. mean, there's business reasons to do something and legal issues to, or not to, do something. Right. But I think as entrepreneurs, we often have a lot of people talking in our ear. You know, you've got investors, board members, friends, spouses, you know, mm -hmm. there's just a lot of opinions around. And I think that can be confusing also when you're doing a deal and, and trying to find your way forward. Oh, it got really quiet. I know. It's like the moment <laughs> of truth now. But speaking of, of, of finding a deal forward, because you do this boot camp yes. for women and, um, and looking for venture capital. Um, do you have any takeaways from that that you could share with the group here? So about? the boot camp is just that after I raised venture capital and I sort of got through this eye of the needle of being one of these 4% women funded, I looked back at that journey and said that was way harder than it needed to be. And we've got to just make this easier for women. So I did a one day boot camp that I still run to teach women to raise angel and, angel and venture capital. And it's really just about two things. Um, it's about the skills and the mindset. I mean, the skills to raise venture capital have to do with having the right financials and PowerPoint and knowing how to approach VCs. There's a whole dance there that you have to learn to dance. But it's not harder than anything else you've done as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You know, People have to figure out how to create products in China and negotiate deals and all kinds of things that are harder than learning to speak the language of VC. But then the mindset part is actually the hardest. And uh, I don't know where this crosses over with deals, but I'd be curious to explore that with you guys, where when you go out to raise any kind of capital, really, you have to project yourself into the company you're going to have once that capital is in the bank, right? Because they don't want to hear about all your problems with your infrastructure and your sales force that doesn't really work and so the accounting system. you're picture of what this looks You've like You've got to take got the them money. into the future, into that happy, bright, shiny place. And it, it does you know, require some suspension of disbelief mm -hmm. and compartmentalizing. And working on that mindset to make that deal happen is really the hardest part. And that's one of the things we spend the most time on at the boot camp. How do you pitch? How do you present your company in a way to make it really attractive for funding? And then we bring in a guest VC, and there's a bunch of back and forth so that they can have like a real life experience. Excellent. Hmm. You guys all raised outside money. Did you raise outside money? No, I sold my um, I sold my Ford Explorer. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I was just thinking. I was just that's how we started. You know, because we got excited about the fact that now you could do it all with like small cameras and laptops and you could sort of like run a micro studio like that. And at the time that was really fresh. So it didn't need much. That was part That's of the, you didn't yeah. need much and it was yours and everything. But thinking about um, back in the day, bad deals, mm -hmm. I just had a flashback to one, which is one of the early publishers that we worked with said, said to us at a time when we were like paycheck to paycheck and you know hustling in New York, said, do you want X amount? For each episode, or do you want to a point or something in the in the com you know in the in 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 the we were turning these publishers into video, right? Mm -hmm. We were taking them into the space of video, which was really new at the time. And really, I mean, at the time, I don't think there was any way for us to do the latter because we just needed Cash. to pay rent, right? Yes. But then, you know, five years later, um, it got sold to one of these huge companies for a lot of money, and you think like, hmm. You know, sure could you, yeah. could you, right? And so that'll always be the kind of thing. I'm sure everyone's got a version of that. Mm -hmm. um, but would you have been around by the time they sold it if you didn't take the money? Right, that's, that, the question. that's like my eighty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, you can't. Yeah. You can't second guess. Yeah, that's the eighty thousand dollars. Yeah, okay. As long as you make an informed decision, you can't. Yeah, you can't, you can't look back. Yeah, yeah. You have to keep moving. I have no regrets about the eighty thousand. Yeah, and looking back, I don't think we could have done it any other no, way. Yeah, I couldn't. We were in a time where we really needed to eat and pay the rent and you know build ourselves, and it just wasn't the time to do that. But it sort of informs you for the next time when it comes, because it has happened since, where there are opportunities where you see like startups will come to us now and be like, "Can you do a video?" And they never have money. No, but then you never. look at what they, what what it is, the product or the value of it, and you think, "Well, this could be something." I mean, mm -hmm. I'm willing to put our resources and our equipment and our people and our brains mm -hmm. to it to make a what would be a, you know. A hundred thousand dollar video for not, almost nothing yes. to, but what does that translate to? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And you're gonna get a lot of phone calls now. <laughs> you just said that. Well, it, but it, it's it, good. I'm glad you do that. I yeah. think what's interesting in that, it, um, at least in my experience, because I've taken equity many, many, many times, like literally hundreds of times, um, and rarely does it come through. However, I think you don't want to give equity for 
your company unless you want someone to be a long-term player with you. Right. So in a situation like that, you give equity for people that you want a long-term relationship with. For so sure. in that sense, it, you know, it's not just for one video, but of it's, course, it's an a ongoing content. relationship yeah, because you want to be creating value Definitely. consistently. And yeah, I would think be people are offering you equity without looking for your consist consistent participation. They're not savvy enough probably to make something right. really old or nice they know they're watered down later on <laughs> yes you'll be crammed on that's true absolutely but you also have to weigh out you know how far can you get how fast if you take capital now maybe it's going to save you three years mm -hmm. in getting to the market you're trying to get to maybe it's worth it right mm -hmm. but i talk to a lot of entrepreneurs who are really reticent to give up a percentage of their company mm -hmm. and it just comes down to that conversation of do you want to own a big piece of a small pie mm -hmm. or a small piece of a really big pie and there's no right answer to that some people prefer to grow their company mm -hmm. sort of slowly and organically and there are advantages to that mm -hmm. some people want to go really far really fast and that usually requires capital I think there's something that might be a little bit difficult in this group just because people haven't taken outside capital, but um, uh, uh, we've certainly seen people where you've done where you've done a deal with people that really it was in your gut it was killing you you had to you had to do a deal because you had to stay alive, but um, a mm. bad deal is sometimes worse than no deal at all. Do you do you have experiences in that? Mm. Well, I don't, but I could. Well, I could give you a. Because you don't do bad deals. I don't. I don't I do bad deals. Or you counsel have, your. You counsel I've had your. I clients who have come to me after they've made bad deals, though. And they're thinking, what am I doing? Particularly, and particularly with bad Sometimes they money. don't even know how bad of a deal it was until I read it and I go, oh shit, this is a bad deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Can you share some color for right. example? Yeah, and I'll give you an example. <laughs> Can you do anything afterwards? That's, yeah. that's very um, generic, obviously. Um, but I had, you know, it happens a lot, for example, with fashion designers, right? Especially people who have used their own name as their trademark, which I always try to counsel people against. They never listen to me. Um, and, you know, fashion designers, and as, as most creative people who I love, which is why I love to work in IP, because I am creative in my own way, but I, I sort of live vicariously a little bit through creative folks like you. Um, and so, you know, I had someone come to me after she, you know, and, and she wasn't a good business person because, frankly, usually creative people, you know, you guys are the exception, frankly. I mean, and, and hopefully all of you, but, um, you know, hopefully. in general, you know, a lot of the artists I deal with just are artistic and really the business stuff, it bores them. You know, it annoys them. They don't want to focus on it. They have, like, their husband running the company or their cousin or their brother. Who's, or they're afraid. Well, and they're afraid, or whatever the reasons. I won't try to analyze that. But, but frankly, she came to me. Uh, you know, the, the the company was in trouble, and this happens with more, more companies than you know because it's usually under the rug. But you know, she basically sold her trademarks to her company, mm -hmm. and it was her name. And then, you know, basically, my job was to try to, um, you know, limit the damage to that and not let her give away more, which is what they were asking her to do in a consulting deal. They needed her because she was this fabulous celebrity. She was the face of the brand. But she literally worked her whole life to get to this point. Hmm. And, you know, I don't know if at the time, if I was her lawyer, honestly, maybe this was the only deal she could have made. I don't know the financials. I don't know. But, you know, she came to me at a point when she was trying to kind of do business with people who, you know, she did, she did this deal. She, you know, these people were saving her. They were putting all this money into her company. But essentially, she gave away so much of her IP they thought she gave away more than I thought she did, and that was where I would be adversarial and aggressive and pushy, pushy lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, but when they came with this consulting agreement, you know, they basically wanted her to basically unequivocally give away what I didn't think she had yet, or at least it was a, there was an argument for it at this point. So you know, she just struggled and struggled and struggled with it. But you know, at that point, you just almost you, you just have to figure out how do I limit the damage and how do I move forward and what, what do I want to do? Do I want to stay? you know, locked to this brand, or do I want to sort of take what I have, you know, put that behind me and, and put my energy elsewhere? And that's a scary place to be. And you I don't have a name, you've got a symbol after that, right? Your name I, is I have a story similar to uh, yours, right. actually, but that backfired, because uh, I, I wanted to do a deal very early in my career with a very large, like a PBS type organization, <laughs> and I did it, and it was a disaster. Uh, no, they no. kept on wanting me to do more and more. We got them a sponsor, they didn't like that sponsor. By the end of the day, I was working for about a buck an hour oh, for, for months. <laughs> And it's uh, what I realized there is that you know that's when you have to learn how to say no because I thought because it, it wasn't worth it. How'd and you get out of it? Um, it just ended. I mean, I, it was a, you know it was like a two month bad lesson, um, and, uh, yeah. and 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 so that's something to be careful of is you know like you know you know, and I think that's one of the things you do. You think you're smart and you think you're making a good deal and you think you're doing the right thing, and it can blow up.
So that's what you need. You know, not even necessarily a lawyer to look at the paperwork, but a lawyer to somebody or somebody to say, you know what, you're screwing up. This is stupid. But you know, yeah. when you're in a cash strap startup, which I was for many years before I raised venture capital, so there was this one deal that we did. It was a distribution deal. And this is the one that haunts me. Right, for sure. And uh, so we got story. this very exciting opportunity to have our product at Barnes & Noble. Who wouldn't want to be at Barnes & Noble? It's fantastic. So we got into Barnes & Noble, and they said, and you've got you know, 10 days to fulfill this order with some big rush job, and this is the distribution company you're going to work with. It's the sub-distributor, because the distribution company we work with only deals with $100 million orders, so go work with these guys. OK, very intense paperwork. And then it was like, oh, our legal fees are so high. And well, I'll just sign this one myself. Mm. Ouch. <laughs> so okay. signed that one myself. You know, it was early days, but we looked at it all internally and thought it looked fine. And we signed the deal, and the deal said that you know we produce all this stock, and the distributor would take it and put it into Barnes and Noble and pay us. As soon as we produced the stock, you know, probably one hundred eighty thousand dollars worth of stock, and he put it into Barnes and Noble, and they paid him. And they said, "Oh no, I can't pay you." Well, why can't you pay? It says right here you're going to pay us. No, no, I can't take that risk because you're a small company. And if I pay you, and if they return the stock, then I'll never get the money back from you. So, so I can't take that. So we turned the deal into a consignment deal. Wow. So one of my takeaways, and that made me, in the future, a better negotiator, and that's never happened again, um, is that uh, I start thinking about not only what's on the piece of paper, but how, what are all the ways that they can then you know, yeah. If somebody wants to screw later. you, they will find a way to do it. <laughs> right, but you yeah. need to think about all that before you sign the deal, no. and you can no. actually protect yourself before that. Um, and then, unfortunately, that story has a really bad ending because after uh, he wouldn't pay us, wouldn't pay us, you know, he paid us in drips and drabs every time they sold some DVDs he paid us. Then he went under. Mm. So he took $120,000 of our money, you know, so huge and devastating that was what was going on all along. That's why they weren't going to pay you exactly. to get a pyramid was, scheme going. Yeah, on. total BS. Question. Um, there's so much information online right now. Are there any sources or any resources you would go to if you were um, in the audience and you were looking at starting a company, if you were looking at sort of legal advice or frameworks in which to look at things? Do you guys have particular resources that you like? Uh, you can. I, I guess not. <laughs> don't want to tell anyone to go look at a website for legal advice. Um, I don't think it's streamlined like I, that. I think joining because a professional organization yeah, I mean, a professional others. organization is, is usually helpful because they usually have sort of canned things. I mean, mm -hmm. the Copyright Office has pamphlets that you can read about what type of thing is copyrightable or not. The Trademark Office has information on there. Um, but you just have to be, you know, you have to be careful reading things too simplistically. So, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but there are definitely resources on the copyright, uscopyright.gov, or no, copyright.gov and USPTO. Dot gov, I think, but if you you probably just Google, right? So you can Google uh, U.S. Trademark Office, U.S. Copyright Office, but you know that'll give you sort of a, an overarching idea. But in terms of deals and things like that, I don't probably it would be. Some I just sort yeah, of an consulting with fellow CEOs has been a mind, yeah. right. you know, right. a great mine of information. Yeah, for mentors. Me. I would say the biggest resource is you need a good accountant. That, that was my biggest regret is is not having a good accountant at the beginning. Yeah. Because you know you think you want to cut costs, right? But but mm -hmm. they actually are incredibly. They know a lot about business, and they know a lot about taxes and structures yeah. and all kinds of things. Yeah, it's, and uh, yeah, you're really you you're don't so have a right. On the bookkeeping, yeah, that's made true. A that, huge that'll difference. come back to bite you. Yeah, right. it's made yeah. a huge difference for us too. And deal structure, I think. Um, do you have any resources on your site for in terms of business plans? Because people are always saying, I'd love to look at a. At a, at a business plan or get a sense of a couple of things and how people like to see things. Sure, presented. well, Double Digit Academy is specifically for women, but okay. I have aggregated all these great resources. Great. So it's on the site if anyone wants to check it out. Excellent. And then I joined Entrepreneurs Organization, which is all entrepreneurs from all over the world, actually, and they have a local chapter here in New York. Mm -hmm. And that's my go-to place for any question I have about deals, legal issues, copyright, anything, because anything you're going through as an entrepreneur, probably 10 other entrepreneurs have gone through the same Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And they can really help you know, debug it for you. And if you ever want to do a session on why I hate business plans, I, I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> Follow up? Yeah, but you're not investing in them. I mean, if you were an investor, uh, I would say but you, they're a necessary evil. I mean, everyone hates oh, to right, write them. Oh, for an investor, I mean, yeah, because it's, I guess it's like um, camouflage or something. But in, but in terms of an action, uh, actionable document, I always find business plans are, strategy is far less important than tactics. Well, I think that there's two. I think you'll have an outside one and an internal doc that you end up using. But it's good to have a roadmap always, I think. Otherwise, you don't necessarily know where you're going. Yeah. No. Sometimes it's okay not to know where you're going. <laughs> Depends. That's why it's an adventure. 
<laughs> but I think when you're out pitching for money, you're really forced to answer the tough questions that you didn't want to Absolutely. ask yourself. You know, it's, it's, it's as much for you as it is for them, I think, to have to map all that out. And you know, it's a grueling experience to raise money. Even just angel can be really difficult and take many, many months. But the questions you'll be asked will help you avoid pitfalls later on mm -hmm. in your company. At least that's been my experience. Excellent. I'd love to hear what these guys have I know, to say. I was going to say, Ida and Nathan, I know you've got all kinds room of... room full of awesome people here. We want to yes. hear their questions. Can you, can you come and join and do questions? Yeah. Join us? Yeah, absolutely. Questions, thoughts, concerns? Yes. Um, if you don't ask any questions, we have to go home and be really embarrassed by the fact that nothing we said was interesting. <laughs> so please ask a question. Or deals. If anybody wants to offer me a deal, I'd be interested in hearing about it. <laughs> I think we have a question in the second row right here. And they want it to be bigger than it is, are, are, are often looking at a small little amount. They might be doing deals, but their deals are for hundreds of dollars or in, you know, between one and ten thousand dollars. What for each of you or for some of you has been the, the tipping point or your first big deal? How do you get how do you move from like the small fry into the big deal? Hmm. That's actually one of my pet peeves because I feel like I meet a lot of people these days who are under raising. You know, I met this woman who has an entrepreneur. She had this amazing idea. She pitched the whole thing to me. I was like, that sounds fabulous. And she's like, I'm doing a Kickstarter. So what are you raising? She said, $13,000. I was like, well, how far is that going to get you? It's like, if you're going to do it, you know, raise enough to have an, enough runway. I mean, as soon as you go out fundraising, you hear angels and VCs saying, how much runway do you have? And that really is the right analogy, you know, that, that how long are you going to have before this plane is going to take off? And the more cash you have in the bank, the longer your runway. And you might think it's going to take off in six months, but guess what? Ten things are going to go wrong in the next six months, and it's probably going to take twice that long. So the more cash, the more runway. Now, that doesn't answer the question of how do you get the cash. I think a lot of it is knowing how to play the game. I've been fundraising for 20 years, and each kind of fundraising has its own dance. I was a nonprofit fundraiser. That has a certain dance. Angel money has a certain dance. VC has a certain dance. I would say take the time to go learn the dance of the people you're pitching to so that by the time you get there, you know your idea is great. But if you don't present it in the way they're used to having it presented to them, if you don't hit the right buzzwords and have the right way of painting that big picture for them, you're probably not going to get the money no matter how great your idea is. So where do you go to dance school besides Double Digit? I think fellow CEOs. I've learned so much from other entrepreneurs. That was my first stop when I started my company. I, I called every woman entrepreneur I could find and said, you know, will you meet with me? I and then I it. asked them, what are the things you regret that you wish you'd done differently? What are the first three things you spent money on? And, you know, help. And that saved me a ton of time and money. Right. For us, it was just a pivotal moment when we went from working with a lot of publishers back in the day um, to getting an opportunity to actually work with Ted and the when we were at TED um, doing a lot of documentary work for them, this was in like 07, 08, um, we heard through someone at TED that um, GE was looking to do post rolls for TED that were customized. And it was like the first time that we'd worked with a major brand and they approached us um, to do something. And that was a pivotal moment where it sort of went from these small little projects to suddenly like having to look at an MSA <laughs> for GE, which is insane, you know, it's like a, it's like a book. And so at that point I knew like, okay, this is, there was before this and there's going to be after this. And you know, one of the first questions they asked was like, what's your capacity? Like how much can you actually do? Because this, once we get going, it's going to be, you know, it can't just be like you and some other schmuck. This better be, <laughs> you better be really able to deliver. Really have an deliver, yeah. yeah. Right, so I think three schmucks, at yeah, least. Yeah, <laughs> what, what's now an MSA? Huh? What's an MSA? A uh, master service agreement. So those are the things that there's, in my business, there's MSAs and then there's SOW statements of work. of work, right? Scope of work. And so that first you sign a master service agreement, usually with these big companies, uh, that dictates, right, the longer um, Term. terms. And then per project is the um, SOW. Mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah, maybe you should explain, and then the SOW you can't change the MSA. Well, you should say a little more about Usually, that because it's yeah. important, right? Yeah, that's great. I, I mean, look, I, MSAs are not my yeah. specialty, but I have, I do look at them on occasion for my own clients. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, usually these big companies have these massive 30-page agreements with like print this small, and you know they basically just say you know 
we have the leverage, you don't. <laughs> Yeah. And you know, okay, deal with it or don't. Days. You know, so every once in a while you can negotiate a little piece, but usually you can't. So, you know, reading it and understanding it is probably the most important thing, especially if you don't have money for a lawyer. Um, just making sure you don't give away your, your, you know, the farm essentially. Um, but, but then usually that's so that's the basis for the relationship. And then usually by per project you'll get a separate agreement, which is a little bit smaller but not much, and keeps referring back to like some obscure paragraph in the massive agreement. Um, so it's it, you have to sort of read them together, but it's just basically okay. So th here's the, here's our overall overreaching deal, and here's the deal for this particular project, which will usually be more like deliverables, what we're going right. to pay you, when you're going to give it to us, right. who's going to own it, you know, and stuff like that. And MSA is like forever, right? That's while you're not necessarily. You're... Sometimes they'll, they'll have an end date. Right. Yeah. Typically, there. Um, although I found working with clients where they do have these massive MSAs and also scope of work, particularly in situations where they want to do a 120-day payment, um, and if you take, if you like most people would like your money a little sooner, you end up taking a big haircut. Uh, that that you can negotiate in some ways with your client relationship, and and usually the tighter the better client relationship you have, it gives you a little bit of leeway to negotiate around some of these. Speaking things. about yes. that, one of the most annoying things in my industry is that there's agencies and there's clients, and so when you're working with the agency, they based on the deal you sign, they can withhold payment if they haven't gotten paid by their client. Mm -hmm. So that will screw a shop, a small shop like ours, yes. big time, because an agency's, you know, uh, much bigger than we are with a couple of hundred people. We're, you know, 10 people full time, nine directors signed to the roster. That's a small operation. And so to not get paid for a number of months is killer for the cash flow. Yeah. So those kind of like small print things, what's that right. called? The, like they, um, like if they don't get, conditions yeah, they, they don't get paid. Yeah, they don't get paid. Oh, content, yeah. It, if if they don't get paid by the clients, we they, they don't right. pay us. Right. Tough. Okay, right here. Um, are you talking about uh, <coughs> some other schmuck? But I think one of the biggest deals you can make is with your partner and your collaborators. Yes. And sure. um, I'm sure everyone has a cautionary tale, but I just wonder if you could touch on some things that you've learned along the way. Let's talk in private. I could talk about that because I ended, up, um, I ended up doing that years ago when I had a search firm and brought somebody in and did a deal on the gross, not the net, mm. in terms of gross revenue brought in, and it totally killed me. Oh. And it, and, and it was, I mean, it's just it's really, so make sure you understand that's a case of having a good accountant or a good financial mind to work with you because nothing like a bad deal to make everyone feel terrible. And you have, you've got, this happens a lot in commission with salespeople which is that you give them a commission based on because you want them to drive top line revenue and it can be brutal. The way, because once you say a number, um, people keep that number stuck in their head. Same thing when you're looking at equity. If you talk about percentages, it's a bad idea because people want to keep those percentages all along the way and there's dilution because, of, because more capital will come in, hopefully, as you're growing. And so everyone, the dilution changes uh, or the percentage changes because the pie gets it's apportioned differently. So be careful about the ways in which you think about compensating your partners or your key employees. Really important, because people get these things stuck in their head and they feel like whenever you're renegotiating a deal that you are taking things away from them and their value is often tied up in their financial or in their equity. You can also think one of the ways that I play around with it sometimes in terms of equity, which is that you get commission based on revenue brought in and you can do equity based on profitability if you want to look at somebody getting both of those pieces. By the way, Sonny Bates is a badass. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you and know I've that. I've lots of bad dudes. I don't too, know so. if, <laughs> if you know that about that. it longer than everybody else. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I was, at, on my, in my case, I was probably a little cavalier early on in terms of um, the way in which the company was split. And so that took a while to uh, patch up. So that's maybe a lesson learned is that at first, and it's also like with production companies, it's like they barely, they rarely sell, you know. So it's this kind of thing where it's not like agencies where like eighty percent of the agencies are owned by five holding companies. Production companies are like pirate ships. It's like everyone, like you start a production company because you don't want to deal with that kind of shit. So in a way, it's sort of like very few. And when they sell, they're they're doing so well that the sale is not. It's not like in the um, startup world where it's like suddenly you a billionaire. It's not that. It's just like icing on the cake kind of thing. So it's not, you know, I, I had someone approach me about that, about equity uh, not too long ago, and I was like, you don't want that. Like, there's no, <laughs> like, let's, let's work on, to yeah, it. let's yeah, work on it. Yeah, you don't want the hassle yeah. and, the, and the nightmare that is running a small, mid, 
business. You, you want like, let's work on a deal where like, if you're helping me make sure that we're staying on budget and doing all these awesome things that you get compensated and it's sort of like a curve that if the business does better, you do better. And if it doesn't do as well, you do, you know, it's like we work out some kind of um, profit sharing yeah. thing. Like equity can be overrated. Cash is always underrated. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's the money yes. thing again. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one other thing, just an add on in terms of, um, of partners or, um, you know, team members that if things start going south in terms of how you're relating to each other, get a coach, get somebody in there to help you get through it. It's really like therapy and I've watched, I've watched companies that didn't have to go down, go down because they weren't communicating and I've watched other companies completely turn around because they all started speaking the same language and started negotiating in a different way as they were growing in terms of how they work together. And it's really, it's, a, it's an easy thing to do. It will make a huge difference. If you, if you know that you need and want to stay together, it's a really important step. So I highly recommend it. That's why Sonny is my coach. <laughs> I'd be your coach anytime. <laughs> You'll be our coach too, right, Sonny? Absolutely. I just say yes. I mean, I define myself by saying yes to everyone as opposed to no to anyone. <laughs> That's right. Next question. Over here. But you're, you're dealing with one person at a time, though. I mean, like, I, I'll yeah. do a deal with, um, with you know, a company with 80,000 employees that are only talking to one person. You can have a, a conversation with that person. And they often might feel the same way. You get them on side. I mean, they're just, they don't, they, uh, But so a lot of these big companies, the person you're talking to has no discretion to, to edit the agreement. But somebody them. does eventually. Yeah, guess, somebody does, yeah. Right. And they, they may, they, you, you, maybe they're your advocate. I, I mean, I don't know how big the deal is. I mean, if you're doing, you know, an $80 million deal with a large company, that's a big thing. But if you're doing, like us, maybe a ten or $50,000 deal, usually there's a way of, 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 you know, there's only one or two people but that really are decision makers. Yeah, probably It depends one. on what you want to negotiate, too. Price is one thing, yeah. which I think is what you're thinking about. But, but basic terms of the deal, you know, who's got the risk, who's going to own the IP, stuff like that is harder to negotiate, and that's where it's, mo it's more of a problem if you don't have leverage. Um, but there are ways, again, and, and it kind of goes back to what, it's kind of coming full circle, I guess, which is, you know, know the value of what you're offering and know what kind of a deal you want to strike and what's most important. Is, is this going to be the deal? Is this such a company that once you get, is it your GE? You know, one, and I don't want to say you made a big deal. I'm sure you did not make a bad deal with, with GE. But um, if you, you know, if this is something that's really going to launch you, you know, maybe, you know, there are some things you can give on, but maybe some, there are some things you aren't because if there's something, if you, if you walk away from the deal better off, right, and you have to agree to some terms that would be great if you didn't have to agree to, that's one thing. And you also have to figure out, you know, these, these massive agreements have so many terms in them. They're trying to think of every contingency and, you know, sitting down and saying, okay, well, what's the likelihood that this is going to happen, right? Like, so it might look like it's really onerous, but it, you, you're going to know your situation better than anybody. and You're going to know what's going to happen. So it's really just looking at every piece of it, seeing what's important. What am I walking away from? I would say, again, if it's giving up everything you've worked for, it's probably not worth it to get exposure because what's gonna happen after that deal? If you've got nothing left, it's not worth it, right? But if it's just negotiating at a price or something like that, and you know it's gonna it has the potential to launch you, then I would say sometimes you have to suck it well, up. Well, we often negotiate the price with one person and then they pass it along in a large organization to the legal department right. who knows nothing at all about the deal or the council. other than that this. So then, and, um, and, uh, and we get that all the time. Then there's questions about IP and, and you know we can put it on the web. And in general, I always find the same thing, is that you have to talk to them. I mean, I hate these email correspondences where basically people get these positions that are entrenched. And I always find the more you talk to people, the easier life gets. Uh, and just make sure that you just talk to, even to, to, to the, um, the other lawyer and explain. Well, you know, I, we can't give this away, and here's why, or we can't do this. And often, you know, they're reasonable people too, often. And, you know, their job is to protect GE or whomever, but they also aren't necessarily out to screw the deal. No, but I also think that you can also overcomplicate things in the yeah. beginning. I think when I was starting out with my business, you know, I would get these contracts and I would get so caught up in like, oh my God, and what are they, what are they asking? What am I giving away? And I would overcomplicate the beginning of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I had a board member who was like, 
make it easy for them. Don't make it hard for them. You're the little guy. So I really took that to heart. And now when we do deals with people, we actually are much more easygoing about it. Where you know, We also know more intuitively now, what is the wiggle room here? There's not that much wiggle room. So let's not get all caught up in all this back and forth. Yeah, let's right. just start moving. And we'll work it out. And it's actually worked out pretty well that way. I have, I have one other thing to, um, that no one brought up here, but I think reflecting back on what you had said before, the mindset. I mean, just the way you framed that question was, you know, I'm little and they're big, and therefore I don't have any leverage, and they have all the leverage. I think you cannot go into a situation believing that yeah. because you got clobbered. So, you know, really focus on the mindset. And that's, I mean, you brought it up once before, Good and point. I think it's critical for <laughs> everybody in here to be thinking about about their mindset as they're approaching any kind of a deal or any kind of relationship going forward. Um, something I just started doing in my own company because I, I mean, like many people have weird things around money, particularly when it's negotiating for myself and my, for my own company, was to um, get the other person to say the first number. Um, and you know, oftentimes it's way higher than I would have asked for. Um, or if it's completely ridiculous, you're like, are you kidding me? But giving them that chance, and, and it's worked just recently in, in a beautiful way where I was going back around negotiating equity in a situation, and, and, I, and they said, well, how much do you want? And I said, you have to tell me what my value is, what it's been in the past, and what it is going forward in the future. And it ended up being um, working out extremely well. So sometimes <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Sonny's thinking out of the another thing that was really great, too. Yeah. I, another I, badass I, moment I from Sonny Bates. I forwarded it on to my two daughters, and I was like, if you don't ask, you don't get. And they're like, no, mom. Awesome. Right? But, yeah. but I think it's really, it's really true. So in that, if you don't feel like you can be in the business of negotiating and you have something that is unique, then make sure that in your mindset all along you're willing to walk away from something. But if you're feeling like I'm nothing and you're everything, then already the dynamics and the mindset are not good. Yeah, yeah. don't undervalue yourself. That's the thing that, one of the main things that, um, that I learned um, once Kate, our mo mo most recent business partner, came in in 2010. Like really, it's really easy. And because I have that creative and business thing, it's it's a tricky maneuver, but don't uh, you're already in the conversation for a reason. You know? And yeah, I would also say, point. like, have fun with it, right? Because when I was a creative person, I sort of dreaded and hated the whole business side. But now that I'm a business person, I really enjoy it, and I see that as part of what I'm getting to learn. And like, what an amazing privilege to be in this conversation and figuring out how to navigate this deal. Like, I have fun with it now. So and the language, understanding the language. Exactly, learn the language yeah. of deal making. Yeah, because you are just. It can be fun. You're never negotiating with GE. You know, you're always negotiating with a new Bob or GE who also coaches soccer. Uh, and sometimes you have to turn that person into, I, I've had many negotiations where they say, look, my boss is being difficult. I want to do this. And I don't want, so I, we actually spend all of our time trying to figure out how to negotiate with their boss. Yeah. Hey, David, yeah, you, I don't know if we have time to have time for one more story. Sure. So I, one of my deals that went completely south had a really happy ending where we were trying to do this big distribution deal with a company here in New York. and. Uh, the guy I was negotiating with, this is a great business lesson, it turns out he was not the final decision maker. We got right up to contract. We'd been talking for months. I was so excited about this. I had told my board. It was like right before Christmas. And uh, the night before we were supposed to sign, he called up. He's like, CEO just doesn't feel it. It's just not going to happen. So that was a big, big lesson. And always make sure you're dealing with the decision maker. But you know that guy felt so bad, and he really loved what our company was doing. And I called him back a couple weeks later to ask him for advice about something. And then I called him a couple weeks later, asked for advice about something else, signed him on as an advisor. And he's now become a board member and a critical player in our company's future and, and building and growing Do you have a deal with them yet? But you've got him on your we, side. We You're got better. We, got, we actually hired one of their deal. former employees, <laughs> and we can do everything that they were going to do for us. So That's a graduated good. level of commitment. You're getting, you're getting him and on your side. But you so never know where people are going to turn up again, Absolutely. right? So I also say, like, don't make enemies and always turn that lemon into lemonade because people are people, just like you're saying. You know, this guy really loved what we were doing, and now he's become Big one of our board members. Yeah. Right. Next question. Right here.
Well, you can lose, you can lose title to your name. There's a famous restaurateur in Canada, like the greatest chef in the country, and um, you know, he had partners, and it was Feeney's restaurant, whatever, and he lost the right to use his own name in public. I mean, because yeah. it's, it's just an asset. Yeah. Well, yeah. Treme has a great. Uh, and, yeah, no, right, exactly. Treme if you watch Treme, that's a great, that's a great lesson last learned. Season, yeah. Yeah. I love that character. I love her. And can can um, I tell you that for somebody who's you know, run a business under her own name for 25 years, everybody always wants you. It's terrible. And right. then if you want to sell, you're stuck selling your name. And then you sell your company, you have to back up, you put your name back. I mean, I think if you can create an entity that's descriptive, and it could be, you could, you know, your name could be a subtitle. But I feel like as soon as you have your name there, everyone's going to be pointing to you. It's more difficult to scale yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to actually sell an entity separate from you without you going to it. Mm -hmm. So let me, if I can just quickly on the trademark front, because that actually is what I do. The, the, I, I can actually contribute something. I, I, I'm not a camper. Um, the, tra the way you have to look at it is your brand name is your identity, right? So yes, you want the recognition, the personal recognition. But like Sunny said, if you can do, and I don't know, do you mind if I ask what your business is or what you? Um, I'm doing hair I'm sorry. I do um, hair dye and Okay, awesome. Cool. So that might be a little different hair because hair probably hair. you are, you know, you're yeah. it, right? You can't really sell yourself, or I mean, you can, but that's what this whole thing is about, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was not planted. Um, but you know, it's a little different if you are the, the personal service. I'm thinking more about product. Um, it, it could be a company like you know, like Sunny's name, but but probably you know, for you, isn't yes, you should you could probably use your name. I'm talking more about um, if you do a line of product, if you the way it, the way it comes up is that your brand name is your trademark. It's an asset, as somebody just said, of your business. You have to think of it as as such, right? It's an asset. So if you want to sell the business down the line, if you want to create, you know, license somebody the right to use, let's say it's an acrobatic school, right? You're like the next trapeze artist on the, on the river, right? If you want to franchise that, let's say, I'm just trying to think of an example. If you want to franchise that and you, uh, you're going to be licensing the right to use your name because that's, that's the identifier, that's the Nike, right? That's the swoosh, that's what people think of when they think of your service. It's, a, it's supposed to be an identifier of your company, not of you so, and of the product and of the quality of the product. So let's say you, you explode and, and all of a sudden you've got franchisees all over the place like McDonald's and somebody comes and wants to buy it, right? What's gonna happen? You, nobody wants your, your service without your name because that's, what the, that's the value to the consumer. So that's where you get into it. So it's not really a matter of when do you switch, you know, it's, it's more a, a matter of, if you're thinking ahead, you probably want to pick another distinctive name, something creative, fanciful, you know, you guys are all creative people. Pick a name that's not associated with you, the person, because it does get very tricky. There have been lots and lots of cases, you know, there's, there's restaurants, there's, like I said, a lot of fashion designers, and what happens is, then what do you do when you want to go do your own business? You can't use your name, depending on how the deal's structured. And you hire another aerialist, and then you're in that situation too, which is you're not the only person doing the trapeze. Right, right? exactly. And so let's say you, you, you get a partner and you give them equity, and, and so then they own part of it, and then who owns your name? And you know, it, it just gets, you have to remember that, that the brand is what has real value and is an asset. I think that's And also, like Ari, if your production company was your name, you might have trouble attracting top talent, right? Because they want yeah. to be known for them, oh, they yeah. don't want to be under you. Right. So that's also an issue if you're going to scale and grow your company. You want the best people working with you, and they don't always want to be under your name. So that, that's another issue. Patsy Grimaldi right. made some of the best pizza in New York called Grimaldi's. Right. And then he decided, ah, I don't want to do pizza anymore, and he sold Grimaldi's. And then he, uh, oh, maybe I do want to do pizza. So he made Patsy's. The Grimaldi people sold, uh, sued Patsy. Well, they got, that was, that was a big another miss. Patsy <laughs> then Patsy. Another Patsy sued Patsy. Then Patsy Grimaldi sold Patsy's to someone else. And now there's some Patsy's out there and there's some Grimaldi's out there, not, none of which are owned by Patsy Grimaldi. Now he's moved in down the street from his original location and he's named it after his mother. <laughs> Great story. And We're selling his mother short. And clearly. <laughs> he's now being sued. He's now being sued for the second time by, his by the uh, by the the, the <laughs> original Grimaldi people that he sold to because he because he booted them out of their location. He's back in the same. It's a mess. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak to not as not as like a small business, but just as an individual. Um, how do you determine your worth when you're going into commercial negotiations to 
you would have any idea of whether or not your deal is going to be good or not. Yeah, it, Can you be specific? Yeah. Like what's your... Well, that, that as an artist, like you're, you're being contacted because of your creative uh, work or your abilities, but you know, you don't know what you're worth because you haven't dealt with clients at this level before. So you've got to ask them how it's going to be used, for example, I would say. You gotta, you know, how are they going to use it? And if it's part of a commercial campaign and the, and the commercial campaign is worth $10,000 or you know, $100,000 that they're going to spend, I mean, then you charge more. I mean, so, so you just ask, you have to is, ask a context. lot of questions about how is this going to be used? You know, have you done something similar? Um, you know, what did you pay them? I mean, you, you can be blunt. What did you pay that person to do this? The last person who did this for you, what did you pay them? And people will often tell you stuff that you, is remarkable. You think, like, it's amazing. I think there's, there's also resources, too. So I don't know, what, what is your art? I'm a photographer. You're a photographer. So for example, there is a book yeah. that, that gives you, actually, I will, uh, I'll give it to you. Okay. And then you can disseminate it. Um, and, and this is not legal advice, I'm not saying. Um, but but there is there are the books and there's one actually that I've used before for clients frankly that that will give you sort of scales and the one I have I think is kind of outdated but there are you know they do you know and it's always a negotiation so you could always get more or less but at least it will give you there are companies that are out there and I think it's actually an association of of artists who actually put out this book and they'll sort of take a temperature every once in a while and say okay and it, and it's as, it's as, it, it's broken down as much as you know, this sort of art for this sort of a campaign, two layout spread, where is it, you know, this is, I, I sound like a dinosaur because I'm thinking of print, but, no, but, but you know, and, and what's the circulation, and, and it will at least give you some sort of a, a benchmark. Well, the, the, this gets us not so much your work, but your name. Oh. We, wanna, we wanna partner with your identity and use that to promote our company. Like, That's yeah, like, like commission like, stuff, right? Like, for pricing a photo, I'm, I'm familiar with, but yeah. oh, like, I'm oh, sorry. You, want, you want me to like work with you on events and like use my name and oh. put it in the press. And I was just like, I have to well, that's a collaboration. That's a much yeah. bigger that's sort a of master thing. Of, um, artist collaboration. But I think the principle is always the same. You just have to keep asking those questions because it's, it's you know, I, I sell people by the hour uh, for between $5,000 and $125,000 an hour. And really, they're worth only what somebody's willing to pay. And I have and a rate. Yeah, classic. It's, yeah. And you it's know. the same thing with, with us. Each director has a rate that they go buy for a television for a day and for content projects, a percentage of the project that's worked out with them. And, but then there's this level of commission or collaboration that happens with the bigger directors um, sometimes, which is maybe similar to what you're saying, where it's like they want to do this event in Miami and they want to incorporate uh, you in some way and that's that sort of opens up a different avenue but I think you can you can get a sense of it based on the other deals so there's context there's the base of what you're what you charge for your photographs for your creative services and you know make a paint a, that'll help you paint a picture of that. and how long the duration of the deal yes. is and how much they need you and how unique your right, work is to so what they're trying to do all those pieces are bits of leverage um, and then you can just ask them, you know, I, I understand what, how long does this look like it's going to, is this a long-term collaboration, where do we start? And, and ask them to, again, throw out that number, particularly in a situation like yours. You don't want to be the one who's throwing out a number and finding with them saying yes immediately and thinking, oh shit, I couldn't have said twice. Or, uh, you know, but this is also where a professional network would be invaluable yeah. because if you could call five other photographers yeah. and be like, have you ever done a deal remotely like this? And what have you been paid? I mean, I must have done, I don't know, maybe 300 deals since I started my company. And I would say maybe 10 of them I knew how to approach when I started. Mm -hmm. You know, the other 290? Yes. Um, I had to, you know, call fellow CEOs. Have you ever hired anybody like that? You know, and that network is so important to build early on in your career because turning to those people, you just get the best information that you can't find in any book or online because people don't often share that information with except for with people mm -hmm. they trust. But I can tell you the worst negotiation I ever did was on my own behalf. And I think it's one of the things that happens. You get emotionally involved in your own negotiations. So once I was talking to somebody and they wanted me to come out and speak, and I charged them 2,500 bucks for me to fly to Boston. <laughs> and I had never done a deal that small. And one of my other agents actually <laughs> booked another speaker for the same series for four times that price. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, the, sh the shoemaker has no shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but I bet you didn't do it twice. No, I didn't. I only did that once. I didn't. <laughs> and I never got booked again. I like <laughs> Another thing you can play with on that, aside from sort of getting comparables, which is, I think, super important to do, um, is get someone in the background as a shadow um, negotiator. We haven't really talked about that before, because sometimes um, 
so if you've got a lawyer, you can sometimes you can blame it on the lawyer or blame it on the on the faux lawyer. Mm -hmm. But you, it's always great to have somebody you can be talking to, and whether it's a colleague or whether it's whether it is a lawyer, whether somebody who's good at doing deals. If you get a sense that they don't that they want to be doing this with you, get advice in the shadows about how to approach things, so that each thing that you're saying, you've been advised and you're comfortable how to say it, and you've practiced it all the way through. Yes. We have time for one more question. <laughs> Better be good. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Just be yeah, profound. So we'll judge it, right? I think and funny. An appropriate last question is: What do you do when time is short, and instead of having a leisurely negotiation cycle where you can feel things out, for some external reason, there's a finite deadline, and you know that you have to work things out quickly and decide to say yes or no? How do you get the best deal in a short amount of time? What are the things folks ought to think about? I think that there's, there's just no difference. You just talk to them. You just I th talk, yeah, them, I feel like talk to them Harass the lawyer more. Yeah. I think yeah. it's great call, call to have a deadline when you've got something very specific that you need yeah. to get. Yeah, especially if they're very leverage, leverage too. Yep. Yeah, they yeah. need to make a deal. They, too. they need to make the deal happen too. So sometimes so it can actually work to your advantage, you, I find. Yep. Yeah. I, I think identify your non negotiables. I think that's the first right. place to start. And certainly when raising money, you know, you want to know what are my non negotiables. Like you can't have a seat on the board, you know, you can't own more of the company than me and my mother do. <laughs> you know, whatever those things are and take those off the table and then really figure out what do I want most. I mean, I talked about that earlier. Maybe it's money, maybe it's the brand association, maybe it's the security and then be really willing to compromise on all the rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both in business and in creativity, uh, deadlines are good. Yeah, I agree. Shit gets done. Yep. Yeah. yeah. yeah the worst ones, they last forever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Still going. <laughs> okay, so I get the last, <laughs> last question. Um, I think it was Ari, you said that um, money can never be the only reason to do a deal. There's got to be another reason. So what was the best reason? What was the best thing that you got out of a deal other than money? Or mm. in your case, got for somebody else? Mm. That's a great question. Well, again, I keep thinking about people doing things, you know, you do things for love, for money, for attention. And some mm -hmm. people say love and attention are the same thing. But I think that, that <laughs> in, in, uh, it is in one sense, but I think that they're you know doing stuff that you feel like is absolutely like you felt the PBS was exactly the right brand association that you wanted was going to launch your company. I mean that piece, and so you took all kinds of other things into consideration to do that deal. So I think that if you're really clear about what you believe is going to be the reason why you want to do it, and sometimes it's about hiring the right person, and that deal is going to make everything, and you you know you really bend to make sure that you've got that person with you yeah. um, or working with you or doing you know making sure that you honor people that are involved with it. I think that that. Being clear about what the what the intention is, and being clear sort of where on the spectrum of the of the love, money, attention piece, why people do things, um, and sometimes again that's all parts of the negotiating. But I think those are important to, to look at. Do you have an example for us, Sunny, of where you got the love and attention that you never knew you wanted? <laughs> 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 well, I, you know, at the risk of sounding like you know um, sexist, I think that that oftentimes there are women who will do things in order for attention. I mean, when we were talking before about, about maximizing your, your value, people will do things to be able to create a brand and get attention to their brand, and that, I'm talking about the personal brand or their company, um, and that, you know, building a brand in that way, and that they will minimize the financial value in order to, they'll overcompensate because they think that, um, that, that the attention that they get is gonna be of greater value or translate into social capital later. Um, I think that, that you know, I've erred many, for many, many years, for decades even, on the side of being overly generous, and people would say that, and I feel like as we move into a connection economy, it has never been a problem for me because, you know, the generosity really comes back in spades. And you do get, you know, you get taken advantage of occasionally, but for the most part, I have not, you know, for people to perceive you as being generous and being someone that they want to play with and work with, it's a good thing. Yeah, some of the best deals were, um, following an instinct and an intuition and wanting to do something um, that I really believed in, whether it was um, like the TED thing sort of led to many yeah. things or then um, when, um, doing a favor for Alex Boguski when he announced um, he was leaving that world and had this new idea led to him calling us to do stuff for Al Gore's climate reality project, which led us to win um, the the biggest advertising award you can win, which is a con line, which I would never expect yeah. it would come from there, you know? So it's, a lot of it is that, and then on the other hand, you said it, it's like a biz, bringing a business partner that's way smarter than, than, um, than I was to really shape the business into 
um, shape mm -hmm. was probably one of the best deals I ever made. I'm going to talk about money because David said money's hot. I'm hoping you're going to book me for twenty-five thousand dollars now. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. So in when you're raising money, there's what's called smart money, which is when you bring in an investor who also has a lot of expertise and can help you grow your company. And similar to you, there's sort of a nice full circle thing there where when I raised my angel capital, I was not looking for smart money. I just needed money. Get this company going and bring the money in. So I wasn't that picky. But when I raised venture capital, I really wanted money where they would also bring expertise and partnerships to the table. And what's nice is when there is really that good connection, it, it goes two ways, in the sense that we've had this great relationship because they've brought us expertise, you know, we wanted them for that reason, and what started out as sort of just words on paper, you know, smart money has actually come full circle and yeah. been great for the company and for them. And I would say while I talked about, you know, when I negotiated some money about money, but in terms of, you know, building my business, um, virtually no decisions have been uh, based on financial. I actually think if you make a business decision based on the money that you might make, you, you're, you're, in you're on dangerous ground. You end up representing the wrong people right. and, uh, and, and working with the wrong, I mean, I fired buyers because I just don't want to work with them. I, turned, I said no to some you know, big clients just because they don't fit. And, or I don't think yeah. that they fit the kind of brand that I want. Well, and, and I think to that, as a sort of a final note, we spend way more time working than we do anything else. Um, and working with people that are not good people and that are not a good fit, it's like a bad not marriage. Worth it. You just don't want to do it. And so be really careful. Think about it in that same way. You're so like, oh, I think they're okay, but I've got this little pit in my stomach about them. It's like, don't do it. It's really, if you can, if you can avoid it, because I mean, I think people are quick to do deals and then, you know, it's, you, um, you repent slowly. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like the gift that keeps on giving if it's not good, and if it's, if it's really good, it's the gift that keeps on giving in a great way. And make sure there's an out also. Oh, yeah. In all your deals, yeah. make sure there's an out, because all the things that you think won't go wrong might yeah, actually go absolutely. wrong. absolutely. Yeah. Meaning a lawyer. Meaning <laughs> Have a great lawyer, like Andrew. Love you, lawyer. Exactly. Have a great lawyer. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. That was... Uh, Totally illuminating. Uh, I learned way more than I could have hoped. Uh, Me let's too. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Selling out is easy to do. It's not so hard to find a buyer for you. When money talks, you're under its spell. Ah, but what do you have when there's nothing left?